Hi everyone, Nicole Hanna here from Nicole Hanna Jewelry and YouTube's Go Art Yourself. Today I wanted to share with you a tutorial on my wire woven smoke ring. A complete list of the materials and tools can be found at the beginning of this video and I'll be sure to list them in the video description below. But I wanted to take a moment and talk about the specific tools and why I've chosen them for this project. Now the shank of the ring detailed in this video is a 14 gauge round wire that will be hammered flat. What you'll need to achieve this look is a steel bench block and a rubber base or a sandbag. I'm using a sandbag here to absorb shock and sound. Now Pepe Tools was kind enough to send me a couple of their designer bench blocks which come in a lot of different sizes but for this project I really only needed a small block. This one is a little larger than six by six centimeters and I think they have their product size by inches um, and this one is two and a half. It's just large enough for the small amount of hammering that we have to do. Uh, you know, you just want your piece to fit on the surface um, and give you some room to hold on to it. Uh, the reason I highly recommend a quality block like this is its longevity, especially if you're new to hammering. The likelihood that at some point you're gonna miss your wire and hit your block accidentally is pretty high. Um, and I wanted to show you a comparison between damage done to like a, this craft store anvil, uh, and I believe you can get blocks at a craft store too, um, versus using just a quality block. And here on this anvil, you can see the dings that the hammer can create and these are really deep divots which can eventually really impact the smoothness you achieve when hammering, uh, hammering future projects. Now I mean you can keep these uh, damaged blocks or anvils and use them if you want a textured surface of course but um, but if you want a nice smooth hammered surface this is just it's no good this is it's not going to help you at all. Um, and it's just going to end up causing more headaches than it's worth. Now here you can see on the Pepe Tools block, if you can even see it, I intentionally tried to create divots using the same hammer and the same force of blow. And you can see that the divots are so much smaller. Now I have been working daily with this block for two or three weeks now. And, um, I'm pretty rough with it. I am not gentle when I hammer and I'm not incredibly proficient with hammering. I'm still learning. Um, and you can see there's no markings at all on the surface of this blog, which is amazing because I've gone through two of these anvils that I got at Michael's just in the last few months and I don't do much hammering. Uh, but uh, you'll find that the, the steel blocks last much, much longer, and they are in some cases even less expensive than what you're gonna find at a craft store like this anvil. Um, the steel blocks can also be resurfaced, I believe, with the right tools. Um, so I definitely recommend if you're hammering and it'll figure predominantly in your work, um, or even if you're just hammering casually, just invest in a good quality bench block. They're affordable and it'll make a lot of difference. Now what you'll also need is a ball peen hammer. I like the ball peen because it has a large enough surface here that will work well with the gauge of wire that we're dealing with. Uh, you just want to be sure that the hammerhead will cover the metal surface sufficiently to provide that nice flat finish. Now you can see these rounded edges will also help uh, avoid accidentally coming down at the wire at a bad angle and creating marks up in the wire that you're just going to end up having to spend extra time working out either with sanding or further hammering. Why give yourself the extra work really? Now you can of course also texture the wire with the ball end um, if you want that heavily hammered look um, but for a nice flat ring shank which is what we're going for here um, I go with the flat side of the hammer and it does a great job creating that nice um, flat smooth finish that we'll be looking for. And you'll notice this is not a very good quality hammer, also an inexpensive craft store find with a 40% off coupon. It does the job, but it's beginning to show wear already with very minimal use. So it's another thing that I suggest investing in and getting something that's just a better quality. These are not tools you wanna to keep replacing uh, because the surfaces are dinged and scratched and those marks transfer to your metal. Of course, keep them you know, for when you wanna do something that's a little textured. Um, but if you want nice, smooth, uh, finished look, then just invest in a, in a good quality 
Now the hammer also will work hard in your metal. So you'll have a nice solid shank that's not gonna bend out of shape without pretty excessive force. And I like to hold the hammer near the bald end of the handle as far away from the neck as possible um, while still giving me a great solid grip. You don't want it flying out of your hand when you're swinging. And when I swing, it's not very heavy or hard at all. I let the hammer do most of the work and the repetition is what gets the results that you're looking for in a nice consistent manner. You just tap lightly. Here I'm only holding my hammer three inches or so from the surface of the block and I'm tapping repeatedly. Um, and you try to layer your blows so that you don't have any noticeable marks on your wire as you work it um, to that flat surface that you're looking for. You'll wanna start hammering in the middle of your 14 gauge wire and um, work your way out to each end. Now the trick to getting the size right for your ring is to grab a scrap piece of wire here, I have a piece of 28 gauge, or a string, and you wrap it around your mandrel at the size you want until the ends meet, cut off any excess if you have excess, but you want those ends to meet. And then you're gonna lay that wire or string, whatever you used, you're gonna lay it down parallel to your 14 gauge wire and you wanna center it. Um, and you can use a Sharpie, a marker or something and mark each end. And you wanna hammer the length of that string or wire. And it's a good way to get um, the size you want without constantly having to stop hammering and check size on the mandrel and then straighten your wire back out and continue hammering. You just wanna hammer to the each end of that string or to where you marked it with your, your marker. Now you can see here, um, I'm gonna go ahead and move this out of the way. I already have a ring shank hammered. I did this off camera because it's pretty loud and I just wanted to spare you all the noise if possible. And I've shaped it around the mandrel. I have this aluminum mandrel from Pepe Tools and any aluminum or plastic, even ring mandrel will be great for sizing. And once you've got the size you want, you can cut off any excess wire. Leave about a centimeter on either end, just past where the hammering ends. And uh, you, know, you, can, you can trim off the excess, preferably with some flush cutters so you don't have any jagged wire ends to deal with. Then we're gonna pull apart the ends. Um, I'm just using a pair of needle nose pliers. You can use other pliers if you're comfortable with them, but I like the needle nose. And uh, we're gonna create small loops with the one centimeter tails on either end of the ring. And you want the loops to roll away from one another and you want them to have an inside diameter of about four millimeters. So basically these loops, they need to be small, but they need to accommodate a few passes of um, 22 gauge wires as well. Um, and another thing is to test for the size and shape and fit of this constantly, um, because these loops are pulled apart like this. Uh, it's going to affect the, sh the fit of the ring when you pull it apart like this. Um, so you put it back on the ring mandrel uh, and uh, make sure that the size that you're going for can be seen between the two loops. So here I'm going for a size 8. So I want that number um, to be evenly spaced between these two loops. Um, and you want to make sure that the ring is incredibly snug on the mandrel. Uh, I can't stress that enough because of the step nature of this shank where it kind of coils. It's going to fit differently than a traditional band. So it needs to be very, very tight on this mandrel. Um, and you just want to adjust and make sure that those loops are nice and flat on the surface. And that it's very, very tight on the mandrel. Sometimes it might even help to pull it off the mandrel and then tighten it a little bit more. Now that we've got the shank completed, I'm going to move all this stuff out of the way and we'll come back and get started with the weaving used for um, the face of the ring. So just set this aside for now. The weave we're going to do uses three 18 centimeter pieces of 22 gauge round wire. This gauge is important. The ring is already pretty large and using larger gauges will make the size and shape of this ring pretty much unmanageable. Um, so. Uh, definitely use a 22 gauge. I'll refer to these as base wires. And you spread out, fan out the ends of these wires um, just to give a nice channel for this, this smaller 28 gauge wire. And I'm going to call this the weaving wire uh, periodically. You'll hear that. This 28 gauge wire is 240 centimeters. I bent it in half and I'm starting right in the middle of that 20, uh, 240 centimeter piece of wire. And I'm starting on the base wires just about a centimeter or so left of center, it can be adjusted later. So what I'm gonna do 
I've got those base wires layered on top of one another, ends even to one another. And I'm going to wrap this 28 gauge round wire, this weaving wire. Um, I'm going to coil it twice around both of those bottom two base wires. So the bottom and middle base wire, I'm coiling twice around those two wires. I'm going to pass the weaving wire between the bottom and middle wire. which hopefully you can see here. I can't get incredibly close with my camera. And um, now I'm gonna coil, and I'm gonna coil twice around the middle and top wire, so the top two wires. So basically, um, this is what I call the 2-2 weave. It's, it's just the name that I give it uh, for the sake of sparing us some confusion when I refer to weaves. Uh, if it has another name, I don't know what it is. but. I call this the two two weave so you're doing two coils around the bottom two wires two coils around the top two wires and i'll show you one more time definitely feel free also to um, you know pause the video rewind it as many times as you need to if you're watching the video um, from a computer or a laptop uh, there's actually something in the lower right hand corner of the screen i believe that will allow you to slow down or speed up video. Uh, so be sure to take advantage of that if um, I'm going a little too fast. So now I'm finishing the last two coils of this rotation. I call them rotations when you complete um, one section of a weave. So after these two coils, I'm basically gonna end up with two rotations of the 2-2 weave. Now that I've got these two rotations of the two two we've done, um, I'm going to continue along uh, and do a total of 20 rotations. I'm going to do that off camera. So here we've got the 20 rotations. And you can see that it's centered in the wire. If you find that yours is not center, um, you can shimmy it along. Just kind of use your fingers and, and twist it a little bit to get it moving along the base wires. But if you've started a centimeter left of center, you should be. Um, pretty close, doesn't have to be exact. So on this end you've got a shorter tail and on this end you have a longer tail. And where the longer tail is you want to pass those base wires through the bottom loop, what will be the bottom loop of your um, ring shank. And you just want to secure that weave to the ring shank, wrap those base wires around the loop And now we're gonna kind of create this S shape with the weave up to the top loop. And this, it takes some finagling, you know, take your time with it. Play with the shape a little bit. You may have to adjust the shank of the ring. You may have to pull the loops apart a little bit more. Um, make the S shape a little more squat. If you do change or alter the shank of the ring at all, be sure to test it for fit again afterwards. So we're going to pass those top base wire ends through the top loop and curve it around the side of the loop. So we've got three ends pointing to the left and three ends on the bottom pointing to the right. And for now, we're going to work with these right ones. But what I like to do usually is pinch very gently because you don't want to mark up your wire, but pinch those wires closed around that loop. And that just assures that they're laying flat next to one another. You're not going to have wires um, bunched up laying against the surface of your finger. Um, so just flip it over, make sure those wires are nice and flat next to one another. And we're going to work with these bottom three wires where the longer tail of that weaving wire is. I'm separating them again, just like when we started to kind of create nice smooth channels to pass the wire through. See how easy it is to pass this wire through without getting tangled up. And now we're going to coil three times around this middle base wire. Try to get it close up so you can see. And now we're going to coil three times around uh, the two bottom wires. 
And this weave, I like to call it the 3-3 weave. If it has another name, I don't know what it is. Um, but it's three coils around one wire, three coils around two wires. Always when you're working your weaves, shimmy it, compress it with your fingers so that those rotations lie nice and smooth against one another. You don't want there to be big gaps between rotations because then that'll throw off the whole size and shape of your project. So this completes uh, the rotation of the 3-3 weave. We're adding another one here. Um, total, you want to end up with four and a half rotations of this 3-3 weave. You want to have, you want to start with those one wire coils and you want to end with those coils around one wire. And always be sure to compress those rotations in, push them in towards one another with your thumb. Um, make sure there's no space between all those coils and that they're nice and tight together. And then we're just going to create a nice counterclockwise, very tight loop with this weave over the front of the loop on the ring shank itself. And I like to use my finger to guide the shape while I hold the ends of those wires um, with the rest of my fingers in my hand. And adjust as you need to, just to get it positioned right. Okay, now that we have these, um, this 3-3 weave uh, in position, we're gonna curve this remaining base wire on this end here in a clockwise loop inside the curve of that 3-3 weave. You really just want to take your time, reposition as necessary, and get those wires lined up um, parallel to one another as good as possible. Run them through your finger, kind of smooth out any little ripples or kinks that, that occur on the wire. I'm spreading them out again um, to allow for a good channel to pass that weaving wire through. Here you can see I'm even um, adjusting with my pliers to get it positioned perfectly as well. And now on these three wires, I'm going to go ahead and complete a few more rotations of the two of the two two weave that we did in that original S shape. And because the wire is positioned with that three three weave, we're going to begin the first two coils on the top two wires. Last time we did it on the bottom two. So when we start this weave, we want to kind of keep it a good flow from the previous weave. So you start using the same wires. So that was the two coils around the top two wires, and then we'll do the two coils around the bottom two wires. And you can see I'm stopping and using my fingernail to push in um, the weave as I work, because when they're layered like this, it's kind of hard to get those rotations um, compressed and flush against one another. So now we've done 20 rotations of this 2-2 weave. And we're just going to start to curve it to um, mimic that original weave that we did. Always stop and test for fit. I like to make sure that that first weave sits flush against the face of the finger. Um, so after each weave, you, you really just want to take the time to make sure that the ring still fits the way you want it to. So I'm curving this inside or against the, um, the line of that original S shape. And I'm, you know, play around and adjust. Sometimes you may have to pull those loops apart from one another a little bit. Um, just adjust because you want those two weaves laying next to each other, not really on top of each other, not with a big gap um, in between them. So if there's a gap, you really just want to play with it. It just looks better when those weaves are... Uh, sitting side by side. Now we're going to pass the ends of this this weave through that loop and you can see this is the reason we needed um, a loop that is a little larger because it needs to be able to accommodate all these wires and um, it takes even a little bit for me to um, finagle it through because my loop is even a little too small. Um, just try to get it through any way you can. And I've bent it around the back of the loop to kind of secure that weave into place and just kind of move my wires around, make sure I'm not getting tangled up in wire ends. And if you flip it over, you can see the tails of those wires and I'm gonna trim those off. You wanna leave enough when you're trimming like this, you wanna leave enough that those ends of the base wires can really firmly grip on to whatever it's wrapped around. So I'm using my pliers to kind of continue to curl um, these these wires around the loop. 
you just want to make sure if you run your finger along the back you can't feel any of those um, trimmed ends. So now we're going to start working with the last um, three wire ends and you see we've got two um, pieces of 28 gauge weaving wire coming out from here. You want to use the longest of the two. One is going to be just slightly longer than the other one. So use the longer one um, for this next 3-3 three, three weave that we're going to do on the bottom two wires. Just like when we did the 3-3 three, three weave on the other side. So we're going to coil three times around that middle base wire. And then we're going to coil three times around both those wires. And that's one of your rotations of the 3-3 three, three weave. And you want to carry these rotations all the way um, down. You want to do 20 and a half rotations, uh, beginning and ending this weave with the one wire coils. And always stop, take a minute to compress that weave, make sure those rotations are nice and flush against one another. So now we're going to curve this 3-3 um, three, three weave into a clockwise loop. And you want that that weave sort of covering the loop created with the ring shank. And I like to use my thumb to kind of uh, help position the curves because you want this 3-3 three, three weave to also uh, mimic that very first S shape that we did with the 2-2 two, two weave. And you want this weave to curve all the way around where that first 3-3 three, three weave is. And always take time to stop before you secure any wire ends. You want to uh, make sure that your weaves sit nice and they're parallel to one another or right next to each other uh, before you trim any wires. You see this little loop, this bare loop that we created inside the curve of that previous 3-3 weave. Um, shimmy some pliers in there and make some room. And now we're going to trim off the excess weaving wire here. You can just toss that. And uh, we're going to run these ends of these two wires here in between that little space we created. And uh, we're going to wrap those wire ends around that little loop. I'm just using my pliers to help. Uh, there's not much wire length to grip onto. Uh, so use your pliers where your fingers just don't have the leverage necessary. So I'm kind of wiggling it and pulling it into place. And uh, then I'm just going to wrap those ends around that loop and uh, trim off whatever is excess. Before you trim though, always stop, revisit the front of the piece, make sure um, the curves and everything are laying where and how you want them to lay before you finalize anything and trim. And once you trim these ends off, just take your pliers and pinch them closed uh, around that loop, really make sure that they're nice and secure. So now we're just left with this last wire, um, this last base wire and the last um, tail of the weaving wire. And we're just going to coil around that remaining base wire. And we're going to just coil as close to the end as, as you want. Uh, you can always uncoil if you have too many and you can always add coils if you don't have enough. So um, don't, don't feel like you have to commit to a certain length that's really just going to depend on how far apart exactly your loops are uh, on the shank. So I've coiled quite a bit here and uh, I'm curving it, curving this coiled wire inside that little 3-3 three, three weave, weave loop using my thumbs as leverage to help guide that the curves of the the wire. And you want the end of those coils to reach that loop where we secured the weave before previously and as long as you have enough coils to reach that point you can trim off um, your excess weaving wire and discard that but it, you know you have a little extra there if you need to add a little a few more coils so I'm just going to shimmy this in uh, in that little space created by that loop next to the ends of the 3-3 three, three weave and when I pull through before I make any final commitments, I'm just going to double check um, the flow of the weaves in the coil on the front. And as long as I like that flow, as long as I like the position of things, 
Uh, then I can go ahead and wrap this wire around, pinch off the excess here with the wire cutters and uh, pinch that end closed. I'm pulling it close to me so I can see what I'm, what I'm pinching closed here. Just use those pliers and kind of roll it closed around that loop. And you're done and all you have to do now, uh, if you want, you can leave it nice and bright like this or you can give it a liver, liver of sulfur bath and give it a bit of a patina. Um, and you can also try it on, put it on the mandrel, make sure it sits right on the mandrel. Here in this case, I could feel those loops kind of pressing against my finger a little bit, so I'm pulling them away uh, from what would be the surface of the finger. And now it fits uh, perfect and comfortable and I couldn't wear it all day. Give it a little patina and you're all finished. I want to thank you for watching this tutorial. And if you have any questions, definitely leave them in the comments below. I'll see you again next time.